Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us again for another episode of the West San Antonio Chamber Vlog. I am Christy Villanueva, president of the West San Antonio Chamber. We have Dr. Teresa Van Oy from St. Mary's University. She is a professor in the history department, and she's been there since 2007. Dr. Van Oy, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. We're, I'm thrilled to be here and I'm, I'm excited to support your work. So tell us a little bit about what you're working on. Well, we have a very exciting new uh, master's degree in public history. And in fact, our prime area of interest for our graduate students is the West Side. So we're really excited to partner with the West Side Chamber of Commerce and um, bring the history to your attention for whatever it can do it, it can do to support your work. Projects including a documentary film on Henry B. Gonzalez and a, 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 a documentary film on um, Santana's leg that uh, won seven awards and has been viewed in Mexico and in, throughout the United States. So we've been having a great time and, and ready to help you guys. Let me start today's um, conversation about the causal link between race, resident, residency and epidemics. Mm -hmm. As you know, Henry B was from the West Side and was the first Mexican-American to serve in the U.S. Congress representing the state of Texas. So, <clears throat> so I'm, I was interviewing his family and the following story emerged. That is that he fell in love with Berta Cuellar. She was from Floresville. She was a teenager from Floresville and she had been obliged, kind of forced to move to San Antonio because in those days, she was born in 1917, so these are, this is the early 30s. Mm -hmm. In those days, um, many small towns in South Texas didn't have um, high schools for Latino kids. Schools were segregated, so there would be a high school for white kids, but not for Latino kids. So if you wanted to send your kid to your Latino kid to high school, many times you were obliged to send them to live in San Antonio. Well, in the 30s, of course, San Antonio suffered from a policy of uh, a race restricted residency. So Latinos were forced, for the most part, to live on the West Side. West Side is beautiful, uh, but that resulted in overcrowding. Well, that is a recipe for disaster because overcrowding during the epidemic of tuberculosis meant that um, the, the population was very vulnerable. So sure enough, so, so Berta Cuellar's family was faced with this choice. Do we keep our beloved daughter here in Floresville, safe and healthy, but never a chance to go to high school? Or do we send her to San Antonio to live on the West Side with the overcrowding, with the lack of um, sanitation, with people living in corrales, uh, which were basically horseshoe-shaped um, colonias that um, that surrounded a spigot in the front yard, if they were lucky, with a, an outhouse in the back, dirt floors, perfect breeding grounds for tuberculosis. And so they opted to send her to San Antonio, and yes, indeed, she got tuberculosis. Well, at the time, uh, you could send your sick, your patient to the public sanatorium in South San Antonio, but that also was kind of a death sentence. People were mostly just warehoused there until they died if they were poor. So, <clears throat> so the, the family kept her at home. Well, that meant that she had one room to herself, which was very hard when there's overcrowding. And it meant that nobody could enter that room for one year, one year of total isolation in her room. Sounds very familiar now with the COVID. Well, so Henry B. Gonzalez is in love, but he can't see her for a year. He's forbidden to come. Well, Henry B. Gonzalez goes anyway. He goes every single day and he goes into the room next to hers and he sits down and he sings to her through the wall for oh a God. year. 
to, and, and sure enough, soon thereafter they were married and they had eight kids. So, so it's a sort of a beautiful story of love in the time of tuberculosis on the West Side in the, eight, in the 1930s. Um, throughout the history of Texas, there have been epidemics, but Latinos didn't used to be the ones worst hit because they didn't used to be the ones in poverty. So let's take the example of 1833. Mm -hmm. In 1833, there is a, a cholera epidemic that breaks out April 10th through April 12th. Um, cholera hits, hits South Texas. And one of the people in charge of San Antonio was, um, was Ramon Musquiz. This is Mexican Texas, of course, in 1833. These Mexicans are in charge. And he institutes um, three policies. The first is sanitation. So 1833, sanitation, don't leave your garbage out. Um, he, streets were to be swept. He was quite strict, very prescient at the, in the day when people thought cholera was from crazy sources. Uh, he also agreed to, to um, order everybody to wear copper around their neck against their skin, an amulet, because some German doctor recommended that. So he, he agreed to do that one. And the third one was um, that he recommended everybody drink uh, slaked lime, which is the main ingredient in tortillas. Corn tortillas have, in the nixtamal, there's, there's lime. And so the outcome was that really San Antonio was spared. Very few people died. But where they got hit hard was in the Anglo colony uh, at the mouth of the Brazos River. So there, between April 10th and 12th, within two days in 1833, 20 settlers who were living there, of the 20 settlers more or less who were living in that particular place, 11 of them got cholera. And by April 16th, seven of them were dead. So that is yeah. that is that is almost a third of the population died in a week with cholera. cholera. Um, they are less prosperous at the time than, um, than the Latinos in San Antonio who are um, under the care and direction of uh, Muskis at the time. So Stephen F. Austin himself a lot of people don't know this. When he went down a few months later to Mexico City to protest some of Mexico City's policies about Texas, he he got that cholera. So that cholera infected him. And I'll quote what he said. This is in July of 1833. He's in Mexico City. He's attacked by cholera and he says, others have died in less than one hour whose symptoms were similar to mine. This disease prostrates the strength to a most astonishing degree. He did survive, but it was touch and go. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know he could have lost Stephen F. Austin uh, in 1833. Among those who died back in Brazoria though, were his family members, John Austin, both of John Austin's children, William Austin's wife and daughter, and the eldest daughter of Henry Austin. So, so Stephen F. Austin's family took a big hit in this cholera epidemic of 1833. Um, Anglos win control of Texas and Latinos are displaced from their properties and, and, and um, are impoverished. Things go badly and never to this day um, recover. And that's the kind of tragic lesson that history teaches us. So in 1849, so this is after the Mexican American war, after, after, well, after, the Alamo in 1836, mm -hmm. uh, San Antonio suffers 500 deaths in the first half of 1849. And of course, San Antonio is mostly Hispanic still at the time. Most of those are Hispanics. 1833, they were fine. 1849, 500 deaths. One of the sources, and I'd, I'd invite your audience to, to join us in doing this research project if they're interested. It's a crowdsource mm -hmm. project. We would love to have anybody's help on this. Okay. You don't have to be a history student. You don't have to be um, matriculated at any university. You can just come to our library. I'll set up a meeting with you and we'll get you started and you can help us um, 
research this question, but here's the, here's the thing. Okay. Jim Marys has a database of all the Hispanic, all the Spanish language newspapers published in the United States of America from the 1830s to, uh, to the 1980s. So we have them all, California, Nevada, everywhere that Spanish language newspapers were being published, we have them on this database. And so this is a great source for those of us in the community who are saying, well, what happened to Latinos during these epidemics? All we have to do is look at these newspapers. So I'll give you an example of one of the first Spanish newspapers published in San Antonio after the Anglo takeover of, uh, of San Antonio. And this is El Regidor. El Regidor is being, it begins to be published in 1888 and it, um, it goes through 1915. So um, what we find um, are, um, are beginning to talk about tuberculosis and the deaths in our uh, Latino community. Um, by 1915, La Prensa comes in and, we're, and we can look at the obits. So your audience can help us go through all the obits and identify tuberculosis and ages and what i have found my students and i have found so far is that it is mostly young people in their prime who are dying wow. of tuberculosis on the west side in the um 19 teens 20s and 30s just like berta cuellar who as a teenager got tuberculosis mm -hmm. it is young people so i'll give you a couple well here's the most famous one pancho villa's daughter 19 in san antonio uh, Reynalda Villa, daughter of Pancho Villa, died in San Antonio of tuberculosis in the um, in the 18, uh, 1920s. Mm -hmm. Lots more, um, lots more obits, which I could go through if people are interested. Um, there is, um, there are Rafael Ortiz, 28 years old, on Peco Street, died. Um, Guillermo Perez died in the county jail, uh, mm -hmm. accused of killing a German woman. We we see now that people are who are jailed are particularly vulnerable. I think 300 have been infected in the county jail yes. here in San Antonio. And um, there's also, as we know, a high correlation between race and um, likelihood of being in jail um, because of certain policies. Um, and, and women, women, two senoras Ochoas, one was 19 years old, um, died of TB on November 30th, 1915, reported in the papers. Mm -hmm. So the other thing we find out in these papers is that Anglosphere Tejanos has the source of TB. They blame them. So for example, um, food suppliers, Tejanos mm -hmm. were food suppliers. They would bring in milk from vacas, from cows, uh, and and um, dairy farms in the in the area, and so we see in the newspapers that they begin to be accused of causing TB through lacerated teats of their cows. Um, we also see in the newspapers, and this I I think your audience will be interested in. Um, Maury Matt, they begin to be accused of causing TB because they're Mexican immigrants, so they're coming. Immigrants are being blamed. So Maury Maverick, it got so bad that the mayor at the time, Maury Maverick, found it necessary to declare in a public meeting, and I'll quote, it is a positive falsehood that migratory workers cause the high tuberculosis rate here. And this is in the San Antonio Light, November 1st, 1940. He said the local rate is caught, quote, caused by poverty and unsanitary conditions and is two or three times higher than other Texas cities and four times higher than Detroit, where climate and industrial conditions are more conducive to tuberculosis. He's speaking to how bad the poverty and the unsanitary conditions are uh, in San Antonio, and we gotta address them. Uh, yes. As you recall, Emma Tenayuca also, who led the pecan sheller strike, was also struggling for the health of pecan shellers who were particularly vulnerable to um, tuberculosis. How 
today in 2020, we still see so many similarities. It's yep. just, it, it's shocking. Yes, that's uh, that's exactly my, my response too. And the more we learn, perhaps with the help of your audience, uh, the more we can test these these uh, these hunches. What we see in the papers also is that um, quacks preyed on poor Tejano mm -hmm. because they couldn't get proper treatment. Um, so you'll uh, so you'll see them offering all kinds of salves and bombs uh, to, to 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 cure their epidemic diseases, uh, but instead of fixing the real problem, which was um, the um, poor housing and sanitation. Um, now, there was a hospital built for um, the rich side of town. And that was, a lot of people don't know this, that was built uh, by the woodmen of the world uh, over in what's today Alamo Heights, mm -hmm. um, Sunset Ridge, uh, right off of North New Roundfels. That property used to be a three-story Gothic tuberculosis hospital. And when, um, when the Alamo, Alamo Heights property owners found out what it was going to be, they protested, they attended an indignation meeting on December 5th of 1922 uh, to protest having tuberculosis in their community, in their, in their side of town. They didn't mm -hmm. want it in their side of town. Right. And, and they threatened legal action, but that evaporated when the woodmen in the world um, said, fine, we'll drop it if you reimburse the 40,000 we've already invested. Nobody wanted to cough up the money, so uh, the, the hospital was built and uh, existed there until about until the late 50s. How this happened? How did we go from Latinos having such good outcomes in 1830s mm -hmm. to such high mortality in 1930s? so high that Emma Tenayuca is mobilizing against it. Henry B. Gonzalez is singing through the wall uh, to comfort his beloved teenage girlfriend. Um, this young boy, his brother dies and it shapes his vision mm -hmm. to do something, whatever he can. So he goes to St. Mary's Law School, graduates in 1960, and then by 1975 is appointed by uh, Governor Brown of California to lead the um, Agency of Welfare, Health and Welfare of California. So what happened in that century, as we know, was um, many, many discriminatory practices, but I'll focus only on discriminatory housing practices mm -hmm. for the Latino population to live on the West Side. And um, so we um, we know about these race restricted deed clauses. One one deed on the west side. I've seen the actual print on it. It says, "Said property shall never be sold or leased to Negroes or Mexicans." So um, so uh, that policy was finally challenged in 1948. So that, that policy existed all the way through the 20th century, up to mid-century, when the Supreme Court finally um, ended the deed restrictions based on the Shelley versus Kramer uh, ruling. The mm -hmm. lawyer who won that uh, case was Thurgood Marshall, by the way. The Shelley decision becomes influential in a San Antonio case um, that was dealing, that was fighting racially restricted uh, covenants. Mm -hmm. A Mexican American family, actually, uh, the plaintiff was um, was white, and he wanted to get a, evict a Mexican American family by saying that their deed had contained that clause, and he lost ultimately. But uh, but even though now, in starting in the 1950s, these um, racially restricted covenant clauses are being are not being enforced, it's kind of too late. Christy, yeah. because de facto segregation is already in place. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, when there is investment to be, um, to be put into San Antonio, it's put on the north side, UTSA, yeah. 
put on the north side, UT Health Science Center put on the north side. And in the 50s, where does the public housing go? It goes on the west side. Well, that was a good thing then because, um, because it was better than the corrales. It was good to have running water and plumbing. But that practice of public housing on the west side, um, education and, and, and hospital and health investment on the north side um, continued. And uh, of course, we all know about redlining. And so those zones don't get investment. Mm -hmm. And um, and we see the legacy today. Churchill uh, High School has mostly Anglo students and Edgewood ISD has 96% percent Mexican-American and um, and those are policies which reproduce poverty and reproduce uh, epidemic uh, mortality high mortality rates during epidemics I believe that we have the power to change this and we have always had the power but sometimes with our we're in the middle of it and we don't actually see the forest for the trees and um, you know, where can we go from here? Because there's a lot, for me, I see the pandemic as a very unique opportunity yes. for so many to, to rise up and move forward and donate their skill set to a better cause, to healthcare and opportunity and jobs and education. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, from your point of view, what would you see? Well, I agree with you 100%. And the first thing I would do is filling out that census because until we have the data points so we know who's living where <clears throat> what resources we can't we can't justify um budget allocations so uh so we need to stand up and be counted so that we get our share of budget allocations on the west side also so that we can identify um the correlation between race and privilege or good schools or health care or good fire um, fighting resources. If we if we don't get that, that, that data, we can't make the case. So that's the first thing. Second thing <laughs> is we support our um, our students, our, our, our young people, our education. Do you know that in the 1930s, the head of LULAC, Manuel Rodriguez, got in a car and drove with the basketball team from Lanier all the way down to Monterrey, Mexico for a tournament. It's like the top elite Mexican Americans stood in solidarity with the poorest kids. Mm -hmm. They were watching them. They were in the car with them. They were uh, believing in them. And that generation of kids, those Mexican-American kids on the West Side going to Lanier in the 30s and 40s, are our Secretary of HUD today. They are Henry B. Gonzalez. They are our leaders uh, today. So <clears throat> so let's do that again. Let's, let's just all be there for our young Hispanic kids. Absolutely. They wouldn't have to struggle alone. And then also, of course, let's vote. What are the candidates' policies? Who is watching for education and health and um, income generation and sewage and drainage? Who is, who is endorsing these quality of life factors um, for us? Because if one person gets sick, Wuhan, China, or wherever, we're all going to suffer. So let's just all take care of each other and um, and vote vote into office folks who are watching health and education. Absolutely. And no, no one candidate can do it on their own. It has to be all of us helping the candidates succeed and, and push the, everything forward. Um, now, I would be remiss if, if I didn't bring up was it World War II where folks filled out the census and or right around that era and it kind of came back to bite them um, as far as there were people, you know, that 
the census was used against them. I don't think actually we need to fear the census on that one. Um, what happens is that other methods of tracking identity are highly suspect. So for example, in World War II, as you mentioned, those deemed enemy aliens of alien nationality mm -hmm. were forced to go to the post office and register their residence, their occupation, and then correct that every time they move. So for example, Germans, Italians, and Japanese were all forced to, to register at the post office. And so people get confused and think, oh, that was the census. And they got caught because they registered in the census. But no, um, the census wasn't actually recording ethnic origins. Okay. So it's, it's this other registration that makes us vulnerable to later punitive policies that you're referring to in, in World War II. Interesting. Um, yeah. I, um, I think that people can take uh, the census as a, a place to, uh, to exercise power and not to be subjected to persecution. We encourage everyone to fill out the census and make a difference. And even if you lost your little piece of paper and don't have the code, you can still participate because it is important. So, yeah, and we can, you can call us and we'll help you. St. Mary's has a has a, um, a, a law clinic and the history department. We can help you also f uh, find out how to fill out the census. We'd love to. So give us a, give us a call um, and we'll, we'll help folks. In fact, Thank you. Then if you have extra time, you can always um, hop in and, and, and do our crowdsource research project in public history on finding out what happened to West Side neighbors and um, antepasados uh, during the epidemics of the 20th century. Um, I did see that you had a book project, Cinco de Mayo and Civil War in the Borderlands. How do we find that? because this is very exciting research. This shows how Tejanos and Californios, Mexican-Americans living in Texas and California, helped defend Mexico when the French invaded and also helped, uh, helped fight in the Civil War. And they get no credit, especially for Cinco de Mayo, they get no credit for helping Mexico. And so we're looking to let people know. We have found those connections between California and Texas, and we're encouraging our media stations to please look at that and how similar we are. So you've just now reinforced what we've been saying. We are very similar, you know, whether you consider yourself Mexicano or Latino, it's, we are so much the same and we, we have so much to look forward to. Yeah. And there's the case of Obledo, who was a West Side San Antonio boy, one of 12 kids in a, in, a, in a poor family who went on to run the health and welfare agency in California. So that's another perfect example of what you're saying. Yeah, unbelievable. Well, yeah. thank you, Dr. Van Hoy, for spending this time with us. And I hope that maybe we can figure out how to do this again, maybe look into another topic and and talk about your research. Thank you very much for um, for caring about history, for sharing history with your um, constituents, and for offering me a chance to invite everybody to um, to come to St. Mary's and and say hi and express your need and join us on our research if you if you can. Even even one hour is a gift. Wonderful. We will definitely do that. So thank you everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and look out for new innovative and interesting things happening from St. Mary's History Department. We'll see you next time. I'm Christy with the West San Antonio Chamber. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time and stay safe.